Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy and the privilege that you give us to be able to magnify and exalt your name. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to magnify and exalt your name in our singing, to magnify and exalt your name in our prayers, to magnify and exalt your name in our giving, and now to magnify and exalt your name in your word. I pray that, Lord, throughout this entire service, would everything that we have done be a, as of incense before you, pleasing, a pleasing aroma before your awesome presence. So, Father, we dedicate ourselves to your word and to the instruction of your word, for it is in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 You may have your seats. Please join me as we celebrate the worship team. Let's give them a big round of applause. Uh, thank you, Jemo and Nate. Can we also celebrate our band? Let's give them a big round of applause. Uh, thank you. Asante sana. Let's also appreciate Pastor Andy Mburu for leading our service this morning. Let's give him a round of applause. Asante sana. Uh, Pastor Andy, you should tell them today is a unique day. The person leading the service and the person preaching went to the best high school in Kenya. Uh, so it's a, it's a rare day, okay? This is a rare treat eh? to get two uh, men that went to this amazing high school. And just for purposes of clearing the air, the best high school is a school on Thika Road, not on any other road, eh? just, just to clarify uh, things. The amazing Mangu High School. Buona uh, Tena, let's give Andy a big round of applause. Asante sana. So I don't know how your morning began. Those that are visiting with us, we are beginning a series uh, this month on the kind of church that touches people. Um, and I did some research and I actually found a church that completely transforms people. Okay, so regardless how your day began, this church transforms people. So why don't you watch this video? Wait, watch this video. Watch this video, because I have found this church. Eh? Please watch this video. close because it takes me five minutes. Honey, That's perfect. Seriously. Jack. Well we're already late for church. Hey you Brian. Get yourself dressed. Did you pick up my stuff from the dry cleaners? Uh ooh. Zipper's broken. All right, I'll go grab a safety pin. I got the high score! Uh, Anna, what are you doing? Daddy, I'm painting your fingernails. Well, that's great, sweetie, but go get dressed. I need you to stay still, okay? Honey. Come on, let's go! 
Okay, everybody needs to eat. Here you go. Here you go. Okay, here you go. I forgot my shoes. Oh, honey, we gotta go no. back. Nobody's taking off their shoes. And I want everybody to understand that we're all <gasps> what? We made it. Yep. <laughs> now I think this video applies to those that come for the first service. You guys don't know what pressure these people are going through, right? That's why you come for this service, eh? Uh, but just in case there was some pressure, please turn to someone next to you and tell them, we made it. <laughs> okay? Some of you literally went through this experience in the morning, eh? <laughs> but this was on a light note. Okay, this was on a light note. On a serious note, this month we want to look at the kind of church that touches people. So as Pastor Andy had mentioned, we're talking about touch, and the image we're using is the image of a hand, because most of the time we use our hand to touch things and to feel things. So this month we're looking at the five fingers of touch. Today we'll begin with the first finger, and we talked about T standing for teams, so each of these fingers stands for one of the letters of touch. T stands for teams because the kind of church that touches people is a church that is functional. They serve together, and there is unity within the body, and everybody carries their weight. The second is O, one-on-one. -on -one. It is a church that is person-centered. They know God personally, and they know each other personally. It's a relational church. You, the kind of church that touches people, is a church that invests in the next generation. It recognizes their role in investing in those that are younger than them. This is an intergenerational church. See, the kind of church that touches people is a church that is conscious of the needs around it. That's why it's community, the surroundings, the needs around it, and it is a church that engages with its community, its immediate community, and meets these needs, shares the blessings that it has received. Finally, the kind of church that touches people is a church that does not ignore the issues that individuals are going through. It is a church that does not just focus on growth, it focuses on health. The well-being and the health of individuals and families is top priority. It is a church that is transformational. This is the kind of church we would like to be and to belong to as Nairobi Chapel Gong Road. Over the next few weeks, we will unpack each of these items, each and, one, each, each and every one of these elements of a kind of church that touches people. So let me begin today by looking at the kind of church that touches people is a functional church, T, one-on-one, -on -one, sorry, uh, teams, a church that serves together, works together, and is able to carry its weight together. So it is a functional church. So let's begin there today. Now the human body is a masterpiece. It's one of the greatest marvels in our universe, the human body. How God created it is nothing short of a masterpiece. The human body is made up of so many systems that it runs on. The skeletal system, the nervous system, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the digestive system, the muscular system, and others. I could go on and on, multiple number of systems that it runs on. But the human body has millions and millions of cells. No one actually knows how many cells comprise the human body, but people have estimated that the number of cells in the human body is 10 raised to 14. 
the power of 14. So that's 10 with 14 zeros after it. That's the number of cells that are in our human body. They say just the brain cells alone, the number of cells in our brains are more than the leaves in the Amazon forest. That's the complexity and how amazing the human body is. The human body is a display of both diversity and interdependence. It's an amazing interplay of diversity and interdependence. Let me give you an example. The cells in the res respiratory system are dependent on the cells in the digestive system and the circulatory system for them to be able to be nourished, for them to be able to be alive. This system must depend on these two systems. And the list goes on and on and on where the human body is concerned. The human body is one of the best analogies of what the body of Christ needs to be. And that's why the text that we're looking at, in the text that we're looking at this morning, Paul uses the analogy of the human body to describe how the body of Christ is designed to function. So allow me to turn our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll be reading from verse 12 to verse 31. First. Corinthians chapter 12, we'll be reading from verse 12 to verse 31. And as we typically do, in honor of the reading of the scriptures, the holy scriptures, I'd like to kindly request us to stand as we read from the word of God, as we read from the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll pick up from verse 12. Now, we love reading aloud together. So we'll be reading just for sake of harmony. We're using the NIV. You're welcome to read along with us if you have the NIV. If not, you're welcome to look at the screen so that we can speak forth God's word together, okay? Verse 12, together. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but it is made up of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it will not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body was an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, 
and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And he talks about the greatest gift of love in the next chapter. So Father, we do receive your word with joy and gladness. And pray that you speak to us and allow this word to come alive in our hearts and in our congregation today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may have your seats. So a functional church touches people. That's where we are. When you hear the word dysfunctional, what comes to your mind when you hear the word dysfunctional? You know, oftentimes we use or we apply the word dysfunctional to relationships where you say that's a dysfunctional family or that's a dysfunctional marriage. We use the word to describe relationships that are not working the way they are supposed to be. Now, according to the dictionary definition of the word dysfunctional, the definition of the word dysfunctional is in direct reference to the body or a body or an organ in the body. This is the definition. Dysfunction is the disordered or impaired functioning of a bodily system or an organ in the body. So if my body is not working the way it is supposed to be, or an organ in my body is not working the way it is supposed to be, it's correctly referred to as dysfunctional. Now there are several things that make a church dysfunctional. There are several things that, not make, that do not just make the human body dysfunctional, but using the analogy of the church, like the human body, there are several things that make the church, the body of Christ, dysfunctional. And those are the things I'd like us to look at this afternoon. From the passage of scripture that we've just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul brings out three things that make the body of Christ dysfunctional, that make the body of Christ not work the way it is supposed to work. And those are the things I'd like to bring out and challenge us as a congregation, not to have dysfunctional bodies, but to allow this body of Christ at Nairobi Chapel Gong Road to be a functional body. So these are the three things that cause dysfunctions within the body of Christ. Number one, insignificance. Number two, independence. And number three, indifference. Insignificance, independence, and indifference. And these are the things that we look at from the passage that we have just read together. Let's start with the first one, insignificance. From verse 15 to verse 16, can we read this again together? Now, if the foot should say what? Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body, right? And if the ear should say what? Because I'm not an eye, then I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop becoming a part of the body. Now Paul challenges our imagination and imagines a situ situation or a scenario where the foot in a physical human body looks at the hand of a physical human body and probably starts getting jealous about the hand and maybe the foot is saying something like, as a foot, I'm all the way down there, and the hand is up here. I'm on the ground. I am even covered with a shoe, and yet the hand is exposed, and everybody can see it. But my foot cannot even be seen. I operate in dusty areas, and I am prone to gather dust and dirt, and I pick up and step on everything as I go along. In fact, the environment I am in is even smelly as a foot, and that's my predominant environment. And I'm not like the hand. I'm not like the hand that is 
there and open and ready for action. It's part of the action. The hand is visible. The hand is skillful. The hand is exposed. The hand is touching things, left, right, and center. But I'm just a foot. And Paul continues to extend that imagery by using the ear and the eye. And probably the ear is at a place where it's saying, I'm not like the eye. I'm disadvantaged. I'm not like the eye. All I do as the ear is I hear sounds. I'm not the, like the eye. The eye is always seeing sights and colors and lights. The eye is always out there. And people look at the eye. They look straight at the eye. And the eye gets the privilege of seeing people directly. And the ear is complaining because it's saying, even when people are talking to me, they're not even looking at me as the ear. Because I'm out here and I'm hidden on the side. The eyes are sparkling and radiant. The eyes experience light. The eyes fulfill one of the greatest jobs ever. Some of you know that we get 83% of our, the knowledge of our surroundings from our eyesight. We get about 11% of the knowledge of our surroundings from our hearing we get only 3.5% of the knowledge of our surroundings from our smell. So just there, just from that alone, you recognize how important and how valuable the eyes are. And probably the ear is thinking the eye has such an important job in determining the knowledge of its surroundings. But just because the foot is not a hand, it does not mean that it is not part of the body. Just because the foot is not the hand, it doesn't mean that the foot is a non-important part of the body. By our feet, we stand. By our feet, we walk. By our feet, we make progress. And we can go on and on to describe the unique capabilities of the feet. Because the ear is not an eye, it does not mean that the ear is not important. Think of the delights of good music and the ability to enjoy good music. Think about the delights of a mother who's just given birth and she hears her child's first cry. Think of the delights of someone being able to tell you I love you. I could go on and on and talk about the delights of our hearing. The point that Paul is making is that all the parts of the body are indispensable and all the parts of the body are necessary and all the parts of the body are significant. They are important to the body because there is a unique and a critical role that they play. The body's diverse capabilities make the body able to enjoy a full, healthy, holistic experience. Even though they are not all equal in their impact, even though they are not all equal in their importance, at the end of the day, it is critical to be able to know they are significant. Someone here today may have the gift of service. Or someone here today may have the gift of giving. Or someone here today has the gift of intercession, prayer, and intercession. And they probably are feeling, I never go up on stage. I never get the opportunity to belong to a committee. Maybe nobody even knows me or knows me by name. Maybe they're thinking nobody notices the role that I play in the body. I can't preach, I can't sing, I can't do all those things that are out there that are noticeable. Those things that everybody, it catches everybody's attention and you're probably there. And Paul is saying to you today, even if, even if you tell yourself that you are insignificant in the body of Christ, Paul is telling you that is not true. That is not true. The reality is this. Your complaints of insignificance are not just directed at yourself. Your complaints of insignificance are actually directed at God. The very person who created you that way with a particular purpose and a particular intention and aim. 
and God, God's heart is broken that you don't recognize how significant and important you are, and that is why he created you that way. Even if your gift is obscure, even if your gift is behind the scenes, God wants you to know this morning that your role is vital. Your role is significant. Your role is intentional. The giver himself, the creator himself, created you that way because he needed you to play your part in his body, the body of Christ here. This church will never function well, will never function in a healthy place unless your part is played in the body, unless your role is played within the body of Christ. In fact, there's a verse I'd like us to read together, verse 18 of this entire passage. It's probably the most significant verse in this passage. Can we read verse 18 together? Together? <coughs> God has placed the parts, every one of them, just as God is the one that has placed every single part of this body in its rightful place, just as he wanted it to be. I'm here to tell you that God has gifted you uniquely. And God has placed you in this body uniquely to accomplish his purpose and his plan. And no amount of self-pity can change the fact that you have a divine purpose and you are a very significant part of the body of Christ right here at Nairobi Chapel, Gong Road. Regardless how you feel about your gift, it doesn't change the fact that the creator himself gave it to you for a purpose and his greatest joy and delight will be to see that purpose being fulfilled within the body of Christ right here. Number one, insignificance. Insignificance can make a body dysfunctional. Number two is independence. Independence, verse 21. Can we read together? The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts that seem to be weaker are actually what? Indispensable. And the parts that we think less honorable we need to treat with special. You know, there are some of us here today, as I mentioned earlier on, that think of themselves, that do not think much of themselves. There are some of us here that feel insignificant and you don't think too much of yourself. But on the contrary, there are some of us that are here that think too much of themselves. And Paul addresses the two extremes in the spectrum. The people that think too much of themselves are the ones that are prone to independence because they feel they don't need anybody else. The people that do not think too much of themselves feel insignificant and so they don't fully utilize and allow their gift to function within the body of Christ. There are some of us who have a role that is upfront a role that is visible. And many times when you have a role that is visible and a role that is upfront, it makes us foolish because we begin to think that those that have roles behind the scenes, roles that are not upfront and are not noticeable, are less important and less necessary within the body of Christ. And too many times we are the ones that fall in the trap of thinking too much of ourselves. And when, again, going to the analogy of the human body, inside your chest right now is beating your heart. Your heart is hidden in your chest. You do not see it. I cannot see it. And it's very easy to forget that there is actually a very small organ in your chest that sustains the entire body, 
Simply because it's not noticeable, simply because it's not out there, it's very easy to ignore its existence to your own detriment. You can chop off my ear and I'll be okay, I'll continue. But you cannot rip out my heart because it's a vital organ in my body. The real heartbeat of Nairobi Chapel Gong Road, the real heartbeat of this church is the Sunday school teacher that right now is hidden in a quest classroom teaching our children. That is the real heartbeat of Nairobi Chapel Gong Road. The real heartbeat of this church is the Karibu host that receives our visitors and takes care of everybody that has attended Nairobi Chapel for their very first time. They are hidden in the Karibu Center. We never even notice that they exist. During the week, they call our visitors, find out how their experience is, and pray with them. Those are the real heartbeat of Nairobi Chapel. The real heartbeat of Nairobi Chapel is the crash facilitator right now in the crash that is teaching the babies at the crash below two years of age, baby Bible, and allowing the baby Bible program to form the word of God in a child as tender as two years, but we don't notice them. They are hidden. Those are the heartbeat of the church. The real heartbeat of the church is the intercessor that right now during this service is praying and covering this service in the prayer room and ensuring that we win the battle in the spiritual before we win the battle in the physical. That is the heartbeat of the church. The real heartbeat of this church is the volunteer counselor who during the week sets aside time to be able to sit in the counseling room and receive people that need intervention and help to be able to deal with different life issues that they're going through. The real heartbeat of this church is the e-group leader that is hidden in our homes that shepherds us and takes care of us during the week as we fellowship in our uh, family fellowships and our home groups. The real heartbeat of this church is the digital team member that is right now online ministering to a congregation that does not meet physically, but ministering to a global audience and ensures the right information in the right context is brought out with the right quality out there. The real heartbeat of this church is the parking attendants, our volunteer parking attendants, and the security team that ensures that we are safe and we are okay while we can fellowship here physically together as a church. The real heartbeat of this church is the teen's mentor that visited a teenager in distress this week to be able to help them through a crisis that they are in. The real heartbeat of this church is a Logos mentor who has dedicated four years to walk with one of our Logos scholars through high school so that they can be successful, not just in their education, but in their life. The real heartbeat of this church is the sound crew member in that container, hidden in the container that ensures the word of God can be able to be brought out clearly. The real heartbeat of this church is the technical team member that you do not see, you probably do not know, but they were hidden in a project site and worked for two years so that when we come back from COVID, you can see the Quest Center up and for our children ready to worship in the Quest Center. The real heartbeat of the church is the outreach volunteer that you do not see, they are hidden. But during the week, they are in our community, feeding children, teaching children, and responding to different needs within our community. The real heartbeat of this church is the divorce care facilitator who every Saturday sits in a small group receiving those that are going through the crisis of divorce and loving them and caring for them and allowing them to get back on their feet again. This is the real heartbeat of the church. The real heartbeat of the church is the faithful sponsor of the Logos Scholarship Fund 
that allows us and has allowed us to give hope to 526 high school students that have successfully gone to high school. They would never have seen a high school without your support and without your sacrifice. You may be hidden. You may be hidden. But I'd like, as your pastor today, to say we cannot do without you. You're like the heartbeat of this very congregation. And allow me today to affirm you. You may be behind the scenes, but you are the heartbeat of Nairobi Chapel, Gong Road. We need you. We cannot do without you. John MacArthur said every sensible person is more concerned with his heart more than his hair. Every sensible person is more concerned with his heart more than his hair. And the lady said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> the third, the third, the third thing that causes dysfunctions within the body of Christ is indifference. And this is where Paul finishes this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He starts with the dysfunction of insignificance. He goes to the dysfunction of independence, people thinking too highly of themselves. And then now he goes to indifference, genuine care for each other. Let's read verse 24 to verse 26 together. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, then every part rejoices with it. You need me. I need you. We need each. That sounds like a song, eh? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Uh, what Paul is saying is that the body needs an eye. Yes, but the body also needs an ear. Yes, but both the eye and the ear need the heart. And there is a connection within the body of Christ that is unique. So what Paul is saying is we should stop arguing about what is more important than the other and start developing a corporate appreciation and a corporate concern for each other because we are connected. And the health and well-being of every organ in the body results in the health and the well-being of the entire body itself. We ought to be as concerned for the one who turns the microphone up in the sound booth as we are concerned for the one that sings into the microphone on stage. We need to be equally concerned for them. We ought to value the one currently teaching a discipleship class in our tents, or teaching a plug-in, or facilitating a plug-in class, or right behind here, teaching a new believers class, we need to be as concerned for the one out there teaching the class as we are concerned for the one in here teaching from the pulpit. We need to have equal concern. We ought to care as much for the children's worker who is teaching in a Sunday school class as we are for an elder in this church. We need to be concerned across the board for all of them. We ought to be as concerned and to care for the person who prepared the refreshments today morning as we are concerned for the finance team that prepared the budget for the year. We need to be as concerned because a functional church is the church where everybody is somebody. Where everybody is somebody. This is a functional church. When everybody is somebody, we weep with those who weep. And that's how he ends this passage. When everybody is somebody, we rejoice with all who rejoice. When everybody is somebody, when a brother falls, we will get down on our knees and we'll pick them up. 
When a sister succeeds, as he mentions it in this passage, we are able to cheer her on in victory and recognize that her victory is ultimately our victory as the body of Christ together. We are one body. When a tear comes to the eye in this body, then the hand should be ready to wipe that tear. That's how the body of Christ is supposed to operate. When the mouth says something that is worthy and that is good, then the heart needs to leap for joy. And then the hands need to clap in appreciation because we rejoice with those who rejoice and we mourn with those who mourn. That is a functional body that recognizes the health and the well-being of the entire body is a point of concern. But as we close, sometimes some of us feel like an appendix in a book. That last page in the book, where you're just there. I don't even think anybody reads it when they're reading the book. And you feel as if you're not quite of any value within the body of Christ. There are some of us who come, yes, we come to church, yes, we hear the message, and then after we hear the message, we leave. And the reason many times we quickly uh, leave and, and, and come back the next Sunday and, and, and not engage in any ministry in any way is probably because we feel that our active passive, uh, we feel that the absence of our active participation in one ministry or the other will not be felt. Our absence will not be felt. The impact of us either playing a role or not playing a role will not be felt. And what Paul is telling us today is this. Your absence is felt. It is felt by this body and it is felt by the one who this body belongs to. The one who created you. The one who gifted you. And the one who has called you to this body to belong to this body. I'm here to remind us that when you became a Christian or when you joined us as Nairobi Chapel, you did not join a club. You did not. When you became a Christian, you joined and were connected with Jesus Christ himself. And that's why you are part of his body. You are connected to Jesus Christ by the unique power of the Holy Spirit. You are now one with him as I am, as the brother or sister next to you is. We belong to Christ. We are connected to Christ as one body. And together we are part of his body. And I'm here to tell you, your absence is felt. The role that you're not playing is making the rest of this body become dysfunctional. And I'm calling us to the place where we step up together and say, my role will not, will not remain vacant. The gift that God has given me will be discharged faithfully within the body that God has allowed me to belong my inability to recognize how significant I am in the body of Christ, my inability to recognize how much I need the person next to you and next to me and how much they need me, my inability to recognize that this person next to me needs me, they need me, my inability to recognize or to show genuine concern for everyone here at Nairobi Chapel is what is causing the body of Christ to be dysfunctional. My insignificance is causing this body to not function the way God wants it to be. And God is calling you to put aside whatever you feel about your gift and rededicate that gift to God and say thank you. Thank you for giving me this gift. However insignificant I feel about it, I know you feel differently. Because this gift is ultimately from you. And I want to give it the significance that you have given it. My independence, the sense that I, I, I can do this alone. I don't need anyone else around me. My independence is killing this church. And we need one another. There's somebody that needs you. There's somebody that is waiting for your gift. There's somebody, there's an organ in this body that cannot function if yours is not functioning right. My indifference my lack of genuine concern and desire to go out of my way 
desire to go out of my way to sacrifice for the sake of somebody else's child, for the sake of somebody else's marriage, for the sake of somebody else's job, for the sake of somebody else's well-being. My indifference is hurting the body of Christ. Just the same way that there is no such thing as a non-functioning member of the human body. There is no such thing as a non-functioning member of the body of Christ. The same way there is no such thing as a non-functioning member of the human body. There is no such thing as a non-functioning member of the body of Christ. God has called us. God has called us to be functional individually so that we can be functional as a body. What is your part? What is your role? What is your gift? What is your ability? What is your contribution? What is your burden? What has God called you to play at Nairobi Chapel Gong Road? Let's bow our heads as we respond to God's word. And I'd like you to answer that question to God and tell God, this is my part. Tell God, this is my role. Tell God, this is my gift, and I know it. Tell God, this is my burden, and I know it. Tell God, this is my unique skill or ability. Tell God, this is how you created me, and I know it. Tell God, this is my passion. This is my passion, and I know it, and you know it, God. Just speak it back to God and tell God, I acknowledge that you have created me with a passion, with a gift, with a skill, with a burden, with an opportunity. Tell God, this is my opportunity and I know it. This is my unique place and I know it. And I want to dedicate it back to you, to honor you, to glorify you, but also to play my rightful part in the body of Christ. Make a commitment this afternoon and tell God, my part will not remain unplayed. My role will not remain unfulfilled. My office will not remain open. I will fill it. I will fill it. I will step into that role, that space that you call me to step into. And I make a commitment today to you. It's a personal commitment. So Father, would you deliver us from insignificance? The feeling that what you have, how you have created us and how you have gifted us and how you have called us is not important. It's not vital for the body of Christ. Father, would you deliver us from comparison, comparing ourselves to the person next to us and help us recognize the value, the importance, and the significance of our role. Father, would you deliver us from independence considering ourselves greater than others and not being able to honor and recognize the other gifts that are around us and not to be able to connect with the other organs in the body around us. Father, help us. Would you deliver us from indifference and give us a genuine care and a genuine concern for the entire body of Christ. Father, for the gift that you've just brought to our heart, for the ability, the skill that you've just brought to our mind. Father, we dedicate it to you and pray that this year, that role will be played. That organ will be functional and will play our part in the body of Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we close, there is a card that was placed on your seat. Um, as you came in, if you could just pull out that card, there is something I'd like to I do, uh, it'll just take a minute or two. Um, could you just allow me a few minutes to be able to do this? Just pull out the card. You know, sometimes the reason why we don't play an active part in the body of Christ is probably because we feel that every space has already been covered or sometimes we don't quite know where the needs are. We sometimes don't know where the opportunities are and sometimes it's actually... The reason why we don't play the part is not because we don't desire to, 
It's because we don't know where we can help. In this card, we've tried to be as elaborate as possible to give you as many ways as you can engage in this body. As many parts, systems, and cells in the body of Christ. And we want to just give you an opportunity to look at it. If you could just look through it right now as, as, as we go through it. As you look through it, just give me a minute or two to just do this. As you look through it, I'm going to kindly request if something jumps out of the card, if something connects with your heart, if something strikes you in any way, if something uniquely appeals to you, if there's a place you say, yes, this is me, or there's a place where you say, yes, in this area I can help, I'd like you to mark that code. Um, each of them is given a code, and we've tried to cluster them based on the different ministry opportunities that are here at Nairobi Chapel on Gong Road. And I'm going to kindly request you to graciously, it's going to just take a minute, if you could pull out your cell phone and text, and text your name and the code, excuse me, uh, to this number that is on the screen. Uh, this number, you can text it or you can WhatsApp it, whatever uh, is your preference, but just text it. The reason why we are asking you to do this, and, and as I talk, please go ahead and do it, eh? is because the entire pastoral team would like to come around your commitment. We want to ask you to give us the opportunity to equip you, to resource you, and to usher you into your place of service. God has called us to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. That's the role of the pastor here at Nairobi Chapel. Not to do the work of the ministry, but to equip the saints to play their role in ministry. Consider us coaches. Consider us encouragers. Consider us equippers and resources. We desire to come alongside you so that God will use you as a significant part in the body of Christ. By sending us your details, just your name, uh, by texting us your name, you give us the opportunity to reach out to you, to meet with you, and to orient you and to equip you, to resource you, and to usher you into your place of service. So I kindly request that we do this. Those that are online, it's, the document is actually online. Uh, it's been placed there as an image for you. Please go through it. And then go ahead and text your name and the code to our number, the WhatsApp number that's at the bottom of your screen. Those that are here as part of the congregation, allow me to give you a minute just to do this to actually respond to God and to text in your name and the code to the number that's at the bottom of your screen. For some of you, you need time to pray over this document. And I kindly request that you go with this card, pray over it. And any time in the week or the weeks to come, if God lays a particular burden on your heart, if God allows you to connect with a particular need, I'm going to ask you to just text us. And at whatever time you're ready to engage, we are ready to come alongside you. We are ready to give you the opportunity to play your part in the body of Christ. But could you join me by celebrating all the people that are already engaged here at Nairobi Chapel? Could we just give them a big round of applause? Eh? Amen. Thank you once again. And uh, allow me to just close the service. If you need to you know, stay seated after the service and finish texting, you're welcome to do that, uh, but I'll kindly request that we all arise uh, for our benediction. Please turn to someone next to you and tell them, what is your part? Please ask them, what is your part? Okay, what is your part? That's the big challenge. That's the big challenge today. What is your part? Please tell them, here at Nairobi Chapel, everybody is somebody. Please remind them, everybody is Everybody is somebody, and welcome to that community of faith. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you, and may he truly give you peace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the love of God, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you.